if you're not familiar with, with who we are, um, I used to go around saying, oh, we're an AI and machine learning company. And I've since realized that's pointless because everybody is an AI and machine learning company these days. But we, we're very, very heavily research driven. So a, a huge part of what defines us as a company is we're not just applying machine learning theory. We have um, significantly larger than average research wing who are actually creating machine learning theory. Um, and this, re this relies on them being able to test what they're doing. Um, and the, like the level of maths that, that these people are doing. My first day at Prowler, I walked in and I thought there'd been some sort of mistake and this was actually my first day at Hogwarts because the, the scrawl on the whiteboards was just, it's unintelligible to me. It's magic spells, basically. Uh, but they know what they're doing. I, I count it as a good day if I've actually seen all of the symbols before, let alone knowing what they mean. So they need to test these incredible things that they do and it requires a vast amount of compute power. Uh, to do that. So um, this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why measurement and metrics is so vitally important with what we do because, you know, in the morning on some idle Tuesday, you might have all of our boffins, they're all working on paper, thinking up clever ideas, and in the afternoon they want to actually run those ideas. So our research uh, cluster will go from three CPUs, which is the absolute minimum required to keep itself running, to 3,000 CPUs in about five minutes. So being able to measure what on earth is going on, particularly, it's actually surprisingly less complicated in our actual product environment than it is in our research environment because of the incredibly mean things that these people do to computers. So, um, so th this is why this talk continues to be really, really relevant for me. But before we can talk too much about measurement, we need to actually define our terms. We need to know what we're talking about because it's very hard to improve something if you can't define it. Now, in everyday life, we all walk around talking about measurement all the time. We walk around doing measurement all the time. When you say measurement to someone, you know, they know what you mean. You know what you mean. It's, it's measurement. You measure stuff, you know. But that's not good enough if you want to improve what you're doing or how you're doing things. You need to actually be able to define it. So you could, if you were insane, go as far as they do in, in quantum mechanics which is to state that measurement is the act of interacting with a probabilistic system to collapse its wave function around one discrete value in its probability space. But we're not going to do that because that's just terrible. So instead, the definition of measurement, that this, on the surface of it, this doesn't sound much better than the quantum mechanics version. But let me, uh, let me give you an example. Um, I need a volunteer, actually. Volunteer, excellent. You have a glass in front of you. I'm just going to hold that up for everybody to see. Here we have a glass. And a very common problem you have in life is that you have more than one glass. And you need to store them somewhere. So you decide you're going to go and build a shelf to hold all your glasses. And because you're a tech person, which probably means you're a bit OCD, all of your glasses are identical. <laughs> so you need, and again, because you're an engineer, you want to optimize the situation. So you want to have the shelves just high enough to fit all your glasses in to maximize the number of glasses per unit shelf area. And that means you need to know how tall the glasses are. Now, uh, since you opted to be a volunteer, bad luck. Um, by eye, how tall is that glass? 50 centimeters. How confident are you about that? 85% confident. What if I said that you have to give me 20 pounds if you're not within five mil either way? Now how confident are you? <laughs> how certain are you that it's 15 centimeters tall? 85% Ooh, okay, still. What if I gave you a ruler? How, co how confident would you be then that whatever measurement you give me is right? 99%. 99%. What you've done there by I, I wish I had a ruler. I forgot to bring one. I meant to have one. This show is meant to have props. <laughs> I don't usually, it's not normally glasses because normally it's a meeting room. But um, by using a ruler on an object, what you're doing is quantitatively reducing the amount of uncertainty you have about whatever that measurement is, whatever the value is. That's what measurement really is. You're sort of sure about something and then you measure it and you're more sure than you used to be. That's what measurement really means. You can have your drink back now. A little bit of mine too. 
so um, this is the definition that, we're, that I'm going to use, basically, to, to think about measurement from now on. Now, obviously, like I said, we measure things all the time, especially in technical fields. We measure things constantly. It's the bread and butter of what we do. We need to know how things are going with the things that we deploy. Um, but it's important to realize that there are four main reasons to have information. Okay, well, that's basically what you're getting when you measure things. And anytime you measure something, it's important to realize which of these four reasons you're doing it for. The first one is that it's part of your product itself. Maybe it's billing or invoicing, or maybe your product is that you give people web analytics, whatever. In that case, the measurement, the information, it's part of your product. That's reason number one. Reason number two, which is the one that I'm going to talk about the most, is that it informs your decisions. Okay, you have a decision to make, and you need information to guide that decision, to decide which way you're going to go on something. Okay, that's reason number two. Reason number three is that it affects behavior. Now, these two and three are very, very closely related to each other. Behavior, your, your behavior is basically a, a long series of micro decisions that you're constantly making, usually unconsciously. Okay, but, but the information you have available to you at any given moment affects how those micro decisions are taken. So information that's available within your workspace will affect the way that employees of a company behave to each other and to customers and so on. That's reason number three to have information. Reason number four is entertainment. Anything, and this, okay, if you're, if you're at home and you're watching some terrible reality show and you're getting information from that and that entertains you, fine, whatever, that's, that's a private matter for you. I won't judge you very much. But if you're at work and you have measurements and you have information that doesn't fit into one of the first three categories, it's entertainment for someone, or what's more correctly referred to as vanity metrics. If the, the world is full, and every time I say this, I look for who, who does the eye roll, then I know. The world is full of companies that have managers that are asking someone to write a report about something that gets read and never acted on. Okay, the managers are receiving reports that are entertainment to them. They like it, it does nothing. Okay, that is a waste of time, and it's a waste of resources, and it's a waste of money. So number one, if you're measuring things in, in your company, in your business, your organization, your, your infrastructure, whatever, it should be for one of the first three reasons. It shouldn't be entertainment because you're wasting money at that point. Or more to the point, you're losing money. So this brings us to the point that we measure things because information has value to us. Okay, the more certainty that, uh, that a measurement gives you, the more of that uncertainty it takes away, going back to our example before, the more value it has to you, up to a point. Okay, going back to the, you know, the, the example with the glass there, I could go out and I could spend hundreds or thousands of pounds on a laser micrometer that can tell me, you know, probably in angstroms, if you know what those are, how tall that glass is. But that's pointless. You're building a shelf. You don't need to know to that level of detail how tall the glass is. You need to know, you know plus or minus five mil, and that's all. Any more uh, extra certainty that you have beyond that point is, again, a waste of time and money. And that's something you need to keep an eye out for. And that brings us to this idea that I like to call a triangle of compromise. Um, it's <laughs> You might, you might say it is or isn't a compromise. It, it was once wisely said that two people in a room is compromised, three people is politics. But the triangle of compromise you're probably the most familiar with is faster, better, cheaper. Okay, if you've ever take, when, taken your car in for an MOT, you can almost guarantee that the mechanic's got that poster on the wall that says faster, better, cheaper, pick two. Okay, but in reality, you're not really picking two. It's always it's some blend through the middle. Now, in our case, we're not talking about faster, better, cheaper. We're talking about certainty, value, and cost. Every time you choose a metric, every time you choose a measurement that you're going to take, you are solving this triangle again. You need to work out how certain do you need to be? How certain do you not need to be more certain than? How much value does that level of certainty provide you with? And what's it going to cost you? Okay. Now, it's, it's important to realize that 
again, we take measurements and we have metrics and we have information in our systems because it helps us to understand the environment that we have. You have a complex thing deployed somewhere, you need to know what's going on. You need to understand what's going on. It's all about understanding. Or again, if you're not getting more understanding from your metrics, they're entertainment. Okay, so that begs an even deeper question. What does it mean to understand something? So let's talk about understanding, understanding. Now, there's a lot of ways you could tackle this, okay? You can talk about it philosophically, you can talk about it psychologically, you could talk about it neurologically, which by the way is a terrible thing to try and do in an AI company because there's a lot of people who know more about that than you do. But I'm not gonna do any of that because all of it's boring. So instead, I like to talk about understanding using a paradigm known as data information knowledge and wisdom. Now this isn't mine and it isn't new. There are probably as many versions of this as there are authors on the subject, but I'm gonna give you mine, then you can have another one. But rather than digging into the, the details and, and definitions and things like that, I'm just gonna do it by example, okay? So here is a piece of example data. What is it? Almost. It's the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Now, it might seem a little silly to, to use this as an example, but I do this because it actually tells us something really, really important. If you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll know that one of the main story devices is the fact that the answer to the question is pointless if you don't know what the question was. And that is a fundamental problem that companies everywhere, tech companies especially, have with their metrics. There are you know, Grafana dashboards the world over that have got a lot of really interesting numbers on them that people don't understand when they look at them because they're seeing the answer but they don't know what the question really was. So let's have a look at a slightly more real example. This is a different piece of data. Okay, it looks very similar to the previous one but it's different, you can tell by the font. What is this? Ha! That's unique. I've never had that answer before. Thank you. Okay, we don't know what this is because this is just an answer. We don't know what the question was. So this is data. It's raw. It's a number. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is turn this data into information by giving it some context. 42 degrees Celsius. Now it's gone from being data to being information because now we know what it is. We still don't know what it means. We still don't know what the question was, but now at least we can relate to it, okay? It's a piece of information. If this was the temperature, in fact, it quite literally was the temperature in my hometown today, um, then it's a reasonably warm day in Australia, okay? If this is the temperature in Cambridge, where I live now, then it's a bloody miracle. Um, there, are, there are a million ways we could relate to this piece of information, but because it's only information and it's not knowledge yet, we don't know how to relate to it. So now I'm gonna frame it in the question so we actually know what it means. So this is turning information into knowledge. Now it's knowledge. Now we know what this is the answer to. Okay, so we've taken a piece of data, 42, and we've turned data into information and we've turned information into knowledge, which means we only have one thing left. Now it's wisdom. <laughs> and the funny thing about this is every time I do this, I can always tell who's worked with server rooms or data centers before at this point. <laughs> because they do that thing where they go and they suck a little air in through their teeth, okay? Those people don't need this slide. They already know this is shit. These people are wise in the ways of server rooms. They instantly know this is bad. Whereas if you went up to a pastry chef whose life revolves around having an oven at 160 or 180 degrees and you say, oh, it's 42 degrees in the server room, they don't know that's bad, okay? That's where knowledge becomes wisdom when you actually begin to have this deep intrinsic understanding of, of, an, of an area, uh, of, a, of a problem space so that not only do you have the ability to make decisions and coming back to this measurements are about decisions thing, you have the ability to make good decisions because what you want in a business is that 
more of your decisions are good than bad. Because if it's the other way around, you go out of business nice and quickly. So this is about choosing the right metrics is what gives you the ability to make better decisions more of the time. You're never going to get it right all the time. You just need to get it right most of the time. So that brings us to the question of, oh, sorry, no, one more point before I get on to that. Just going back to our little uh, pyramid here. And by the way, it's very deliberately done as a sort of pyramid shape because especially at the moment, the world is drowning in data. There is so much data, it's unbelievable. Okay, some of that becomes information. Even less of that becomes knowledge. And sadly, I think the more data we have, the less wisdom we actually have. There's very little of that floating around. So it's very deliberately drawn like that. But the key thing to realize, why are there animations on this? I thought I got rid of them. Um, the important thing to realize is if you have data and you have information, you can take action. But if it's purely just data or information, you don't have enough to make fresh new decisions. You need, it needs to be at least knowledge or preferably wisdom if you're going to, it needs to be knowledge to make decisions, it needs to be wisdom if you're gonna make good decisions. And this is critical when you have teams of people who are all responsible for the same thing. You need everyone in your team to react the same way to the same metric when it changes. You don't want some people, you know, sort of clattering away just above the dotted line trying to make decisions from first principles every time. Whereas, you know, Joe who sits in the corner just instantly knows what's going on because he saw a number on the dashboard because, you know, he's, he's been doing this for 20 years and has the wisdom surrounding it. You need to choose your metrics and display your metrics in a way that allows everyone to work like Joe. That allows everyone to work like the wise because of the way you framed the metrics and the story that it tells when it gets to people. And there's one other little thing I'd want to throw in here as well. This, the, the naming of this slide comes from, uh, from this phrase, uh, which came from a lecturer I once had, who would say all the time that there's no such thing as an orange ometer. It turns out that almost everything in business and in life, almost everything you actually want to know can't be directly measured. Okay, so if you have two oranges and you want to know which one is a better orange, which one should you eat, there's no orange ometer. You can't just stick an orange in something and be told, oh, that's the better orange. <laughs> what you have to do is go and find things that can be measured that will give you an idea of the thing you really want to know. And there's no hard and fast way of doing that. Officially speaking, the thing that you really want to know is called a referent, and the thing that you can actually measure is called a measure and, in that very pleasing way that the English language tends to work. And you, you need to go out and, and find your measure ands. You need to find the things you genuinely can measure, which when you put them together tell you what you really want to know. And that is a very, very difficult thing to do. No one gets it right first time but it's something you really need to spend time and energy on doing or you're measuring the wrong thing, okay? Which is probably even worse than having entertainment metrics. If you're measuring the wrong thing, you can go in the wrong direction. So what do you need to actually know? And th this, is, this is the real crux of the whole thing, is most people, when you say, oh, I want a dashboard for something, they'll dive straight in at the data. Oh, I need to measure this and I need to measure this and I need to measure this and I'm gonna stick it up on the wall on a big TV. And that's almost always the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is to ask yourself, what does success really look like? What does it mean? What will it feel like? What is your, oh, sorry, before I get onto the pictures, some more words. Um, we're, we are talking about metrics now, not just about measurement. Uh, it, it is important really to, to understand the difference between those two. When you say metrics, you're still talking about measurements, but you're talking about measurements that are specifically useful for understanding your environment. Okay, out of the millions, or you could argue if you were so inclined, an infinite number of things that you could measure, your metrics are the, the handful that you've cherry picked out and said these are the most important things for us to know. Okay, that will help us understand our environment. So, you start with your ambition. What does success look like? What does it feel like? Okay, what does it sound like? You start with that. Now, if this sounds a bit like writing a mission statement for a business, you're right. It, that's really what this is like. 
you need to start with what it will be like for things to go well. Then you can break it down into objectives, concrete things, things you can tick off of a list. Ambitions are usually a bit more hand wavy than that, okay? Objectives are concrete. You can tick them off. You can go red, green, this is, we are doing this, we're not doing this right now. That then means you can start talking about your decisions. What decisions are you going to have to take? Oh, it's 42 degrees in the server room. Maybe I'll go for lunch. Bad decision. Okay, what do I do when, when the temperature in the server room goes above you know, 25 is a key decision you need to make if you have a server room. But the, perhaps you've got 1,000 server rooms and the temp temperature's gone too high in one of them. Maybe it is okay to go to the pub because 999 of them are fine. Okay, so the, you need to, your objectives will drive what kind of decisions you need to make. When you know what kind of decisions you need to make, you know what kind of knowledge you will need in order to make them. And then you can talk about data. Once you know what it is you need to know to make the decisions you need to make so you can tick off your objectives and be happy and, and sunshiny because your ambition is being fulfilled, then you can choose what data you want on that big TV screen on the wall. Okay? Now, it's interesting to note that we've chosen metrics in this direction, but you use metrics going the other way. Okay? The, the direction in which you choose them is the opposite to the direction in which you use them. And the problem with a lot of metrics around the place is that both of those start from the bottom up. People will start with the data, choosing their metrics, and then wonder why all their decisions are terrible because they haven't started at the top and come down. So what makes a good metric? Um, again, if you, you can lose, and I did, several days of your life to Googling this question. Um, I've picked out some of the ones that I really, really liked when I went Googling this question. Um, good metrics, firstly, they're actionable. If you can't take an action off the back of a metric, why are you looking at it? Okay. You, you, might have a metric, you might have a thing on a dashboard that says, right now, there are 700 active computers in our cluster. <laughs> and? Is that too small? Is it too big? Um, you, know, it, you don't know. It needs, to be, uh, it needs to be actionable. You need to be able to take an action off the back of it, or you're just wasting everyone's time and, and mental bandwidth um, in, in having it there. It needs to be understandable. You need to know where it's come from. You need to know what it actually means. You need to be able to take that piece of data or piece of information and convert it to knowledge in your own head. If you can't do that, if you don't understand what it's telling you, it's a bad metric and you need to pick another one. Related to that, your metrics need to be commonly understood. Okay, you need everyone on your team to get the same knowledge out of that metric. If everyone on your team gets a different picture from seeing the same number, they're all gonna take different actions. They're all gonna make different choices. And that is almost certainly bad for your business. Everyone on a team or a company or whoever it is that has visibility of this metric needs to understand the metric in the same way. If you can't do that, it's a bad metric. And last one is timely. The best information in the world is useless if it's too late to do anything about it. Okay, knowing that it was 42 degrees in the server room yesterday is no good if you've come in today and all of your computers have melted. Uh, there's a, um, there was a moment in time in the uh, Cambridge University Computing Society that is still among those in the know referred to as the thermal event. Um, it's sort of a club. You're either in or you're not if you know what happened. Um, but that, that was a case of, of a, a great metric coming too late. Uh, literally, stuff actually melted out of... You know, you've seen those pictures of people who've put pizza in the oven with no tray? And it just... Yeah, actual computers did that once. So it's important that your metric turns up in time for you to do something about it, or it's a bad metric. Okay, so these are things to think about. And there's one more that I've given its own slide. Is this thing... Now, I... I hadn't seen this phrase used with respect to metrics until I was originally researching for this talk you know, about, um, about four years ago. This phrase, instantly useful. An instantly useful metric is one that not only tells you what's going on, it tells you what to do about it. And it's very hard to craft them like this. But I'm going to give you an example. 
here is a very, 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 very common alerting uh, alert out of a, a monitoring system. Server whatever has reached 90% of its disk space. For some reason, we always pick 90%. I don't know why. I think we're just cargo culting it from ops person to ops person. But um, now, obviously, the reason I put this on a phone is because when this goes off, if you've ever worked in ops, you'll know as well as I do, this always happens in the middle of the night. And this happens. Now, you need to decide in this moment, do I need to get out of bed? Is this worth getting up for right now? And the truth is, you don't know. Now, you know what's going on. OK, this is timely. Hasn't run out of disk space yet. OK, you, un you can understand it. Probably everyone on your team understands this the same way. You all get a mental picture of a graph or like a, a picture of a disk with a red bit that's almost near the top or whatever. But it's not instantly useful because it doesn't tell you whether or not you need to get out of bed at 2 in the morning to fix this problem. Because this could be why you got the alert. And uh, I, I don't know who's actually worked in a traditional ops setup before, but if, if you go into any NOC, any network operations center anywhere in the world and wait long enough, you will eventually see someone holding up a straight edge to their screen to see when this is going to go off the bottom of the graph. It's a bit cottage industry. But this could be the reason. Now, this, this could go on for months and still be fine. Or the reason you got the alert could have been this. Which means, yes, you absolutely need to get out of bed right now and fix this problem. What, whatever the solution might be, that's outside the scope of this talk. But the, the thing is, you get that message on your phone and you don't know the difference. You don't know the difference between these two. So an alternative, instead of saying what, you know, how much of the disk is being used, what thresholds have we crossed, what you can do instead is have a metric which is how long until the disk will fill. And that means those same two graphs now look like this. The first case, the one you don't need to get out of bed for, is way up there. It hasn't crossed over the red line. This is not going to wake you up in the middle of the night. Despite it being 90% full, you do the maths and you work out, oh, that's fine. At, at that speed, it's, it's two months until this thing fills. Wait till Monday. This, on the other hand, still wakes you up. It still crosses the line because it's saying you will run out of disk in two hours. Wake up and fix this. And then question your life choices about why you're on the on-call rotor. <laughs> so th this highlights the, the difference between what are called lagging metrics and what are called leading metrics. Most of the metrics we use are lagging metrics. It's a, it's a report. Okay? It tells you what's happened in the past up to this point in time. A leading metric is a forecast. It tells you what will happen in the future if you take no action right now. And what that means is you can see what's going to happen. You can see that your disk is going to fill, or you can see that you're going to run out of bandwidth, or whatever it is, while there's still time to do something about it. And they're incredibly, incredibly powerful. Now, they're not necessarily the right choice for everything, because predicting is hard. Okay, I, I work for a company whose huge part of what we do is uh, is time series forecasting, and we have some incredibly smart people, and they tell me it is really hard. Okay, so if you get this wrong, it'll be worse rather than better, because you'll be forecasting incorrectly, and you'll be saying, no, no, it's fine, I can, I can stay in bed while your building is burning down. Okay, but if you can get some of these leading metrics right, and most of the major monitoring platforms now have some of this capacity built in. The algorithms are already built in. They've been written by the kind of people that I work with, uh, crazy maths boffins who, who get this right. And if you can find the right leading metrics to use in your environment, they're incredibly powerful. One word of warning about metrics in general, though. There's a thing known as Goodhart's law, which this, this, is, a, this is Marilyn Strathern's version. She was an a anthropology professor at Cambridge. The original version is incredibly dry and horrible, and I, I won't waste your time with it. Maron Strathen uh, reworded it to this, which is much more generally applicable and usable. This is about the fact that, and again, this happens in businesses everywhere. You have metrics, you have KPIs, and then you spend your life chasing them. The point of a metric is to steer you towards those ambitions. Okay, the things that define success for you. The moment 
success is defined as make the number hit a certain target, it's useless as a metric. Because uh, as an example, th this, this was actually offered up as an example after the very first time I gave this talk. One of the team leads in the company I was working for at the time came up and said, this happened to us. We decided we wanted to be, we, they were a customer focused uh, professional services team. They wanted to make sure that if any customer engaged with them, sent them an email, put a ticket on their ticketing queue, whatever, that it would be seen to immediately. So they came up with a metric, and he was quite honest about the fact they came up with it out of thin air, that um, every time a ticket appeared on, on the ticketing queue from an outside source, it must be dealt with within 30 minutes. And what that means for the way they actually implemented it is it has to change status on the queue every 30 minutes, because then you know someone's gone and done something about it. But what actually happened was every single member of the team, without discussing it, started to game the system. Ticket turned up and you moved it from triage into pending, boom, you're fine. You've changed its state within 30 minutes. You've done nothing for the customer. They, they don't see that change. As far as they're concerned, it's still an unanswered email. But yet every single member of, of the team started to do this same thing because they were too focused on the number and not on the success that the number was supposed to get them to. There's a corollary to this, which basically says that the greater the reward for achieving an outcome, the greater the reward for simulating that outcome. So you can still hit your metrics, but be doing an awful job of it. And it's really, really important to keep this in mind. So in practice, keep your eyes on the prize. Understand why you have the metrics, not focus on the metrics. Right, I'm, I think I'm out of time. Uh, am I out of time? Your little red wheel went away. Um, so to take away points, yeah, metrics are the, the measurements that we choose to understand our environment. That understanding is critical, okay? Begin with understanding what your ambitions are. Then drill your way down to the metrics. Don't do it the other way around. Consider the qualities that I went through before. Actionable, understandable, commonly understood, timely, and instantly useful. Remember the power of leading metrics over lagging metrics if you can get them to work for you, but always be pay a lot of attention to the fact that leading metrics are hard. You've got to put a lot of effort into them. Don't just pick one and go. And remember good heart for If you can remember nothing else from this talk, remember that. Don't focus on the metrics. Focus on your ambition and you'll be happy. If you focus on your metrics instead of your ambition, you will be sad, I promise you. Thank you.